welcome on behalf of Shark Lab Malta to this first um, online event, um, which has been solely run by Shark Lab Malta, celebrating World Oceans Day. Um, obviously a very important day in the calendar for highlighting issues related to the marine environment. Um, and so firstly, welcome and thank you for your interest and attending this, um, this presentation. It's with great pleasure, I'm going to uh, introduce Rachel Doyle, who will be um, taking this talk, giving this talk. She is the scientific officer of Shark Lab Malta, and she is responsible for scientific data collection, coordinating the scientific aspects of the organization, which is a very critical role for Shark Lab Malta, and helps us to gather information, which we can then use to engage the public, either awareness activities, or even to, to put pressure or inform, informed weight on Maltese authorities to try and put better protection in place for shark skates and rays, which is our main field of research. So without any more delay, I'd like to pass over to Rachel and I hope you enjoy the, the presentation. Like I say, feel free to ask any questions in the chat box and we'll try and address them all at the very end. So now Rachel, over to you for the presentation. Okay, thanks Greg. I'm going to start sharing the screen. There we go. So is that okay? Can everyone see it? Perfect. Okay, so today is World Oceans Day, and uh, as Greg mentioned, us in Shark Lab, we're just going to talk about a bit about the general what what is World Oceans Day, and what we as a, an NGO here in Malta uh, try to do to contribute to World Oceans Day. So, for those of you that may not know what World Oceans Day is, it's basically where everyone and anyone that has a passion or an interest or knowledge of the ocean comes together and share knowledge be it scientists, NGOs, companies, or just general public. And we agree to help understand more, pledge to protect it in any small way we can, and just basically enjoy the, the ocean more um, and see and enjoy the animals and things that live in it. So uh, it was an idea first proposed in 1992 at the Earth Summit in Canada. So this was a, an international conference of scientists and people that came together to discuss impact or problems that were facing the environment in a general scale but it was the thought that the oceans needed a special day for themselves because they are um, just as important as any other environment so by 2002 it was globally recognized and it grew in popularity and publication they launched their website they got the official date which is june 8th every year and throughout the world they had global events by 2019, though last year, they had the most about 2,000 events in a, um, across 140 countries. Now, this year is a little bit different. As you can see, we're doing it virtually instead of in person, but they were still hoping to get at least 2,000 events like this across about 150 countries, which is going to be an achievement. So why did they think that the ocean was going needed to be, or why is the ocean so important to us? Oceans on this planet cover about 72% of our lovely planet here. Every second breath we take it comes from the ocean. So that's half of the world's ocean supply, or oxygen supply, sorry. The other half, of course, comes from our forests and our greenery. But no one stops to think about how important the ocean is. So every second breath you take, thanks to the oceans. It accounts for about 97% of the planet's uh, water supply comes from the ocean as well. So again, a huge importance to us. A few things that it also does is regulates climate, weather, and um, what we enjoy here in, in uh, Malta. It's a large food source. If you think about the global population, how much fish food do we eat? And of course, recreation. As divers, as uh, mariners, we all enjoy the ocean. I'll go into them a little bit more um, in a few minutes. But yet still only 2% of the oceans are protected. Now this year's World Oceans Day being 2020, they want to protect at least 30%. So we've gone from that near 2% up to a great massive 30% by 2030 by different uh, programs, projects and initiatives that I'll go into in a, bit, um, a little bit later. So this is coming together from ideas that we need to work together to establish protected areas, uh, more sustainable activities, not just fisheries, but also development, marine traffic, recreation and things, everything that can impact um, on the ocean. So, as I mentioned, um, it's responsible, the ocean are responsible for our lovely climate we get here in Malta and across, uh, across the globe. 
Now, I know this image might look a bit, whoa, but if you find where the Mediterranean is and you see the Atlantic coming up there in the middle, if you follow that red line, that's warm water coming across the Atlantic and then down in through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean. And this is how we get our lovely warm climate. You'll also see it goes down by the poles, it gets cooler as it goes down there. But this transfer of heat is vitally important for all life in the ocean, not just here in the Mediterranean to give us our lovely um, sunshine all year round. So a few other things that makes the ocean important to us. A few of these images will look very familiar to people here in Malta. We'll start off with the top left there, lovely colourful fishing boat. So not only does it provide job security for the fishermen, but also the boat builders and the people at the market that process um, all the fish. Underneath that one, you'll see a selection of fish. As I mentioned, a huge, a huge percentage of the population in the world, not just in Malta and the Mediterranean, but worldwide, people enjoy to eat fish. And they visit countries, even people coming to the Mediterranean, they enjoy the different species and tasting the different seafoods of the countries. Next, we have on the top, the middle one, um, who doesn't love a day out at the beach, whether it be a big sailboat like this, a little rubber dinghy, or even a little paddleboard going out, just re relaxing by the beach. Get away from your busy, busy day. The one underneath that, of course, that will appeal to a lot of us here in Shark Lab and a lot of my diving friends, scuba diving. Who doesn't love to go underwater and just enjoy the silence of the underwater world and relax? Not just here in Malta, um, but worldwide, people travel to different countries to, people might live in a landlocked country and they enjoy going to other countries that they can actually enjoy the pleasure of being in the water in the marine life. And then on the far right, you have, a, 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 again, a very iconic picture from Malta, the Gozo Ferry Channel. Not just in Malta, it provides transport from Malta to Gozo, but also if you think of around the world, how much gets transported by ships, be it cars, machinery, medicine, food, clothes, a lot of things get um, transported by um, ferries and ships. Now, the next slide, don't worry about trying to read the little pictures or the, the little writing. I tried to make it as big as I could. But this is a new branch of marine science that's coming up in the last maybe 20, 25 years called marine biotechnology. A big word, but well, basically it boils down to uh, the study of how we can get things from the ocean or learn from the ocean to treat illnesses and sicknesses that humans suffer from or even animals suffer from. By studying different marine organisms, you see there in the middle list of uh, example of some of them that we use and then on the right you have a list of um, things that they can help us uh, find cures for. Okay. So why do we need World Oceans Day? It's to highlight things that are happening in our ocean. So about 90% of our big predator species, not just sharks but whales and dolphins, they're disappearing as well as some of our coral reefs and other ha marine habitats. So I'll go on to the importance of sharks and our big predators later, but I'll just focus on the, the coral there for a minute. This is from our lovely uh, Great Barrier Reef down in Australia. Now on the right hand side you see it's nice and healthy, what a coral reef should look like. But due to different things like increased CO2, increased temperature, human disturbance, the coral reef can get stressed and you'll see that in the middle there. But then if you go to the left, this is where it's gone beyond stressed and it's unfortunately died. Now not all stressed coral can die, it can reach a point where it can recover if given the chance, it can come back to the healthy side. But why talk about Australia? The picture on the bottom there is from a, a very uh, iconic picture in Malta in the Mediterranean called Posidonia or Neptune seagrass. Now this plant is, can be seen as an underground forest or an underground garden and this type of seagrass is unique in the Mediterranean. Now, in Malta, we do have a high abundance of this um, seagrass and environment, and it provides a lot of uh, functions from shelter, feeding grounds, breeding grounds, and just general grazing for, uh, for other animals, which I'll go into later on. But according to National Geographic, with the disappearance of all of these um, animals and habitats, it results in a collapse in the ecosystem and impacts on the climate. I'll go into that in a bit of detail in a minute. So, as a result of all these things, um, other, other, um, uh, other influences on the ocean from human interactions. So I'm not sure if anyone's ever heard of super trawlers. Now, if you've ever seen a jumbo jet, that's a pretty big plane. But 
these uh, super trawlers, they have these nets that can actually fit about 13 of these jumbo jets in one of their nets. That's a lot of fish and a lot of animals being taken from the ocean. It doesn't discriminate between fish, sharks, turtles, dolphins, anything and everything can unfortunately get stuck in these nets. This is to try and meet the demand, as I said, for the growing human population and consumption of uh, seafood. Now, on the right hand side, top right, this is an image some people may or may not be aware of. It's called ghost nets. Now, this is where the, the fish nets have detached um, either in uh, stormy weather or got snagged and the fishmen have cut it. The nets then sink to the bottom. If they've had fish caught in it already, they'll get trapped. And then on the way down, more things can get stuck in it as well. It gets tangled in reefs from corals to rocks to seaweed. Uh, to kelp beds and does a lot of disruption to the um, seafloor. Now the one on the bottom there, again is a very common image we're going to be seeing nowadays, is plastic pollution. It, okay, it's unsightly to see when you're trying to swim or snorkel in the water, but also has further effects. It's not just the big bits of plastic, but these things called microplastics. This is where small bits of plastic break down and they become microscopic. So some of our animals are filter feeders, even some small uh, animals eat tiny bits of food and they can get mistaken, uh, they can mistake the plastic for this food. Now, of course, if we're fishing all these fish out of the ocean, we're going to have a lot of hungry animals looking for food and they might be hungry enough to go for the plastic. So it's not all doom and gloom. I'll try and enlighten it a little bit. So Shark Lab, as the name suggests, we love our sharks. So I'll just give you a brief introduction to some of the or characteristic or interesting facts about sharks here. So they're one of the oldest animals on the planet, even older than dinosaurs. People think dinosaurs came first, but no, dinosaurs or sharks beat them by a couple of million years. You see there, 450 million years. Now, they've managed to survive as, an, uh, as a species, five mass extinctions. Now, I'm not sure if anyone knows what a mass extinction is, but it's basically where about 85 to 95% of all life on the planet, not just in the marine, but all life across the planet is wiped out in an event or a series of events. And over time, there's been five of these uh, in our Earth's history and sharks have managed to survive five of them. This shows you they've managed to spread globally and the resilience and the biodiversity of, of this species, which is pretty impressive Consider most animals have been wiped out in these extinction events. Around the world, as I said, they've spread to every type of environment. Some have even managed to survive in a brackish or less salty water and Gulf rivers, but I'll get on to that later. So about 500 species are recognized at the moment. As scientists are discovering and researching the animals, this number can go up or down depending on uh, the science. But here in Malta, we have recorded about 35 of these 500 species which is pretty impressive for such a small island in, uh, on the global scale. Now this can range from our small uh, local residents, our smaller spotted cat sharks, like that, to our seasonal visitors of the bigger animals. Um, and I'll show you a few of them later. Now, a few interesting facts about different sharks. Our smallest one is our goblin lantern shark. Now people think sharks need huge, massive uh, sharks with a huge mouthful of teeth. But our goblin shark is only about 15 centimetres when it's fully grown. That's kind of tiny. Now they live quite deep in the water, a couple of hundred metres underwater. So if they don't need light down there, they can actually generate their own light. And that's why they have a, a glowing belly. Where to get their name? Lantern shark. Now on the complete other end of the spectrum, we have the largest whale shark, or largest shark, is our whale shark, about 18 metres. And for any of you who've been lucky enough to see one, You'll know the sheer size of them if you've ever uh, encountered one. Next one is our oldest one. Now, I don't mean the oldest, but I mean the oldest recorded one that we've had is our goblin shark. Yeah, I'll show you his image now and you can see why he looks so old. Our longest living shark is the Greenland shark. Now, these guys have been recorded to live somewhere up to 400, maybe a little bit older, years old. They mature, they get to about adult age, about 100 years old. That's a pretty long time for a shark or a big fish. And then of course, our speedy one, our fastest shark is our little short fin mako. But don't let the, the term short fin <laughs> deter you. They can, in short bursts, they can reach up to 76 kilometers an hour. Yeah, if anyone ever driven that fast, that's pretty fast for a fish. 
So, as promised, a few little pictures. The top left there is our little lantern shark. Yeah, you can see him glowing away there in the deep waters. And then on the other side, you have our whale shark. Now, these pictures unfortunately don't do it justice, but they are a pretty massive animal. Even a juvenile um, can be several meters long. Now, if you see the notes of pattern on the, the stripes and spots there, these are actually unique to each animal. Each individual uh, pattern and stripe is like our fingerprint. And around the world, there is NGOs and uh, organizations trying to record sightings of these guys to see where they're going and track them just to learn a bit more about them. And as promised, there's our little goblin shark. Isn't he pretty? <laughs> pretty prehistoric looking thing. You can see why it's one of the oldest uh, species of sharks we have. And then again, we have our Greenland shark. Again, it can be considered as a living fossil. You can see from this picture why it could be considered that. And then our little short well, big short fin mako there on the right. You can see it's short fins, but a body built for speed and all that pure muscle um, in the body design. So why do we need sharks and why do we at Shark Lab try to protect them and encourage people to learn more about them? So as part of World Oceans Day, if we um, save the sharks, we're affecting the, the health of the ocean. They're a good indicator of a healthy ecosystem, healthy environment, and it's good to see them as well. So another topic quite popular today is carbon and CO2 emissions. Now, the ocean can store a lot of CO2, but sharks have a major impact or major part to play in this. Um, as a large predator, they have an impact on carbon stores. So carbon actually gets stored in the seabeds. And if you remove sharks, you're affecting all the animals that interact, live in, on or around the seabed and therefore how much carbon gets stored. This carbon can be stored for about hundreds if not thousands of years, doing a good effect or having a good impact on the, uh, the general planet. Again, they're also an indicator of a healthy reef. So like us, we like to live in a healthy, clean environment. So do the sharks. Some of the functions they provide are removing sick and injured animals or keeping populations in control making sure certain populations of fish don't get out of control, consuming all the food and um, using, up, using up all the shelter. And it's indirectly uh, uh, controls coral and seagrass habitats. And I'll go on to that in a little bit, uh, bit more now in a minute. They also, as I mentioned, maintain local fisheries. If one population gets eaten by another, if you have no sharks to control it, it has knock-on effect, and then the fishermen have nothing to catch to feed the population in, uh, in each country. So this, I've used an example of a, a tiger shark on the right and a, a grey reef shark on the right, uh, left. So we'll start with the one on the right, our little tiger shark, very uh, iconic looking shark. Now, these sharks, um, they keep habitats healthy, as I mentioned. So certain animals like our green turtles and our dugongs, they are our grazers, our herbivores, our vegetarians, and they love to munch away on the seagrass, but these tiger sharks will occasionally cruise by to make sure that one of these animals isn't eating a lot or enough of the seagrass is left behind and encourages, <laughs> strongly encourages our little dugong, our turtle to move on and find another patch of seagrass to uh, munch on, leaving enough for the animals to, other animals to live in and shelter in. But also tiger sharks and other sharks are opportunistic hunters or opportunistic feeders. This means if they see a weak or an injured animal or a sick animal, they'll help remove it. This, if it's an infected animal or an injured animal, it will help remove the spread of disease or uh, prevents uh, injured animals from affecting the, the rest of the population. Again, unfortunately, turtles have been used here in this example. But again, in Malta, we do get a lot of turtles, so it is a good one to keep in mind. As I mentioned, they also uh, balance the food webs. So our little grey reef shark here, two of its prey that will feed on are our parrot fish and snappers. So it'll make sure it won't eat all these fish. Sharks don't need to eat every day, all day, every day, as most people would think, but they will keep um, certain fish populations in check. So if either of these species got increased in numbers somehow, like uh, population blooms, these sharks will come in and make sure that the population stays under control because this will have effect if it's in corals or big kelp or any habitat, make sure that there's enough shelter for all the animals and keeps the biodiversity in an area nice and high. 
So why are we talking about World Oceans Day and what's happening here on a local scale here in Malta? As with worldwide things, human population is increasing and it's going to be a loss of habitat due to our human interactions, developments. Who doesn't want to live or visit the ocean when they go on holidays, either tourists or people moving to the coastlines away from the big cities? This is going to put an increase in demand on the fisheries to provide food for not just the local residents, which is increasing in population, but also the demand on tourists that come to this country to feed and uh, sample the Mediterranean uh, cuisine. Also, with the farmers trying to uh, keep up with the demand for food, there's going to be a bit more agricultural runoff. I think people think, oh, that's only like fertilizer, but in the, envir in the marine environment, that can have knock-on effects of algal blooms and a lot of other harmful things as a result. As I mentioned as well, plastic pollution, people are going to be buying and selling things and there's going to be hundreds of people on the beach and of course bins are going to overflow and unfortunately that find its way into the ocean. And one that we as Shark Lab try to, try to address is un unknowing catching of rare endangered species. So sometimes people just don't know that the species that they're uh, catching is a rare one or an endangered one, or they might not even know what it is. So in Malta, though, it's not all doom and gloom. We are taking steps to try to address these uh, issues and encourage the biodiversity to um, increase again. So the first one there is Natura 2000 Network. Now, some people may have heard this term might have seen Natura 2000 uh, signs around the country. But for those of you that may not know exactly what it is, it's basically the world's largest uh, co sorry, coordinated network of protected areas. It's a network of the main breeding and resting sites in Europe um, for Europe's most vulnerable and threatened habitats and species. It covers about 18% of the European land and about 6% of the marine. And as part of this network, Malta um, have adopted the strategies in this. Now, the next one, the National Biodiversity St Strategy and Action Plan. Sorry, a big mouthful there, but basically it's a 10 year framework for action from all the countries that have agreed to adopt it. Again, Malta being one of these countries. And it's to enhance and save the biodiversity and enhance the benefits for all of us, not just for humans, but the animals and habitats uh, that come under it. This is a 10 year, as I said, from 2011 to this year, 2020. And Malta adopted this strategy in about 2012. So just after a year after it was propo uh, proposed. Now, the next one, as part of this action plan, there was these targets called it, I'm sorry, Aichi Biodiversity Targets. And they were meant to be uh, in place by this year. So what are these? There are basically 20 time bound uh, measurable targets. Things that we can see, we can measure, we can see the effect happening. And again, Malta, for example, have adopted a few of them. Some of them include the um, invasive species plan, controlling and identifying invasive species, uh, protected, uh, protected areas and identifying uh, key biodiversity areas. Again, Malta has uh, adopted this. And conservation of species that are most threatened with extinction. I'll move on to a little bit more about that in a minute. So as a result of these uh, networks and targets, there's a growing number of education and awareness, event, awareness events around the country, in schools, in general public, in different areas. And universities and companies are doing a num uh, greater uh, uh, number of research projects and they're getting funding um, to, to carry out these projects. And again, Shark Lab Malta are part of this as well. We're also seeing more protection for some species of animals and plants, both marine and terrestrial. And you can see that as well around the country at different events. So these are the 20 targets. If anyone would like a copy, sorry, it's a bit <laughs> small, but if anyone wants a copy of this, um, we can email it to you or I can give you the link where you can download a copy. And I've just picked three of the ones that um, Malta are doing, but you see there's a lot more. And you can see, if you read them later on, you can see where Malta is actually doing something to address uh, some of them. So. Shark Lab, how do we fit in there? So if anyone does know about us or doesn't know about us, we're an NGO and we help to address several educational and awareness events each month on the topic of sharks, rays and skates and their conservation in, in uh, Malta. 
We also hold international and school placements for the Maltese and international students. They come to us and they undertake research projects, either for school, university, or just a general they want a career break. Um, we also research on Maltese species, um, some that, that have been here for years and no one has updated the database, or some that didn't know were here before as well. So we also collect fish market data from landed species at the, the Marsa fish market. And this is also where we get our eggs um, for our, um, our, sorry, our egg case projects. I'll go into that a little bit more in a few minutes. We also do research projects with other NGOs here in Malta and across, uh, across Europe as well, and even some international ones. Some of our papers have been spread to international people and they're contacting us for more information and to partner and have relationships uh, with Shark Lab. We're very, we work a lot with um, Italian companies, universities, uh, NGOs as well. So we do a lot, we try to do a lot of uh, international relations. We also work with like the local fisheries department, not just allowing us into the fish market for our data, but also on the legal end of things to help find the steps that we need to get something protected and how we go about it. We also uh, communicate with ERA, if anyone doesn't know, that's the Environmental Resource Authority here in Malta, a local governmental organisation, and they're the ones that help us get things protected as well. As mentioned, international people come to us, but we also have a chance to go abroad and inter uh, sorry, participate in European conferences. For example, last year, um, some of the members of Shark Lab went over to Italy for the European Lazarbank uh, Conference. Basically, a big conference over a few days, discussing scientists and NGOs from across Europe, discussing updates and new research into our beloved sharks raising skates. And then finally, we do assist with beach cleanups. Now, an NGO here in Malta calls the Bell, sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but they're one of the main NGOs that do a lot of beach cleanups and as Shark Lab we do help um, uh, with these as well. So a few pictures. So as I mentioned one of our research projects uh, about uh, Maltese species, this is a little thing called a bullery. Now on the, according to the IUCN ratings this was called data deficient which meant not much was known about it. We knew it was here, that was it. This was from a, uh, a chance encounter during a marine ecology survey we did a couple of years ago, our own break, and we took pictures. We didn't, we weren't sure what it was, so we decided to do a little bit of research. Over the years, we've actually managed to get this from data deficient up to uh, critically endangered. So it's a big step for one little animal to get. Through our research, we've helped uh, get the, this animal recognised, and we continue our research. Our interns and stuff help us um, do this as well. And you'll see, it has a lovely pattern on the back. One of our projects is identifying individuals, like the whale shark I mentioned earlier. These guys have a, a unique pattern, and each one of them has its own um, pattern that we take a picture of, and we can help identify to see if there's new ones coming in, uh, old ones returning, and where they go after they come to Malta. Uh, this is myself and my colleague Jackbo at the fish market in Marsa, recording landed species. But we also look for um, female egg laying species because not all shark um, and ray species uh, lay eggs, only some of them do. The others give birth to a live young. But the ones that have eggs, we can help and we take the eggs out of. Now, on the top right of this picture, you'll see three little shapes. They're actually egg cases from our smaller spotted cat shark. Now, these will actually be taken from the fish market, like you see on the left there, and placed in a, a tank. This will give them a chance to develop, ones, a chance they wouldn't have had if they'd been sold at market, they would have been thrown in the bin with other things. So we've given them a chance to actually develop and grow and hatch. The process with this species takes about four to six months, depending on um, how long they've been in the mother. In the foreground, you'll see two little hatchlings, a few day old hatchlings. Now, once they hatch, we work with the National Aquarium as well. And what they do is they help us um, look after the, 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 the pups until we're ready to release them into the, back into the wild, which again is another about four to six months after they hatch, just to make sure they're feeding okay, they're able to fend for themselves, and they're doing generally well. 
And then, of course, this was from last year um, at a shark release. So this was up in Chircawa. And this is when we released about nine little pups between Nurse Sound and smaller spotted cat sharks back into the ocean. Now, this is a relatively shallow spot, about maybe 15, 20 meters. So a lot of people can come and actually watch this. I'll get into that in a minute as well. But this is, can be a very an emotional day because we've rescued these eggs, we've seen them hatch, we've developed them, and then we're sending them off. So it is a very rewarding day to see them going back into the ocean. Yep. Other activities we have are lovely Greg presenting to um, a group of students. They've just learned how to scuba dive and now they're understanding what it's like to be a marine biologist. So we do this with a different groups, not just uh, high school, also university students as well, or any group of people that want to learn, they come to us. Now the thing in front of Greg is this, it's called a baited remote underwater video. Basically it has a camera and there's a bait box there where our little Maury eel is trying to get into. And it's a passive way of studying animals. Now we try to attract rays and sharks, of course, but again, other opportunistic uh, feeders will investigate. But that is the joy of working with animals, I suppose. You don't always get what you want on the video. <laughs> and then, as I mentioned, we also have international students. Now, in this picture, these were a group of students we had last year um, involved in our bull ray project. We have English, we have French, and we have Dutch. We've had various uh, um, nationalities as well. So we really are an international group. With, with the aquarium, we also do an awareness day. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, we're unable to do these, but this is, if anyone has ever been to the aquarium, this is an example of our stands that you'll find. Not just sharks, uh, shark jaws, you'll also see their, their teeth, their, uh, their skin, their eggs, different parts of their biology, and um, how we're helping to address the problems that they face. And lastly, as I mentioned, Zabel cleanups. We're in the water, we can retrieve a lot more things in the water, on the water, around, everywhere. A vital thing, a vital service that not just us as Shark Lab, but anyone can do from a big cleanup to picking up bits that you see on the beach yourself. So, a little bit more of how you can help us. So, I've told you what you can do, or what we do, sorry. And this is what you can do. If you have any interest in our group, you can come volunteer with us, you can come study with us, whether you're your primary school, high school, uh, university student, if you want to just do a little bit more research with us. Or in Malta, we have a Systems of Knowledge uh, student program. This is a project they do in high school before going to university. And they can come join us, come uh, involved in the organization and learn a bit about what they can do to help join an activity. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned, with COVID uh, restrictions, we haven't been able to do any of our um, outdoor activities yet, but hopefully soon that will change. Each month, we have a full calendar from the awareness at the aquarium to to beach events, snorkel, diving, anything that you can think of that Shark Lab could do, eh, it might be up there. <laughs> or if you really want to give back, you can become a member with us as well. And you get to learn about the organization, participate in events with us, things like that. And just learn a lot more about our cool little sharks and rays. Or you can even adopt one of our little hatchlings. So when the pups um, hatch, you can adopt them. Now, I know other organizations do this, but how, how cool would it be if you wanted to adopt the shark? You can do it for yourself or you can do it for your family, your friend. And on the day you will, or sorry, when it's hatched, you'll be given a notice when your little uh, pup hatches. And then you'll be invited to the release day a few months later. Now, if you're a swimmer or a diver, you can really get into it and join us in the water, as a lot of my friends have done, even my family have come over and seen them. It is a really cool day. Now, if you, if you can't remember everything I've said on this uh, presentation, we do have a website, the link is there, we have a Facebook, and on our YouTube, there is loads of videos of our shark releases, all the different events we do, and if you just want to contact us as well. If you want us to email you anything, we can just contact us on uh, one of them. And I'm going to leave you with this quote. This it kind of hits home to what we do here in Malta, but on a general scale as well. It's from a marine biologist called Dr. Sylvia Earle. She's a huge marine biologist and conservationist um, from America, but she travels all around. And her quote is, sharks are beautiful animals, and if you're lucky enough to see lots of them, it means you're in a healthy ocean. You should be afraid if you're in an ocean and you don't see sharks. So 
I hope you've enjoyed this uh, presentation. I hope I didn't speak too fast or overload you with information. Um, as Ross said, or sorry, Greg said at the start, um, if there's any questions um, or comments or feedback or whatever. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic, Rachel. Thank you very much for your detailed talk. Um, <laughs> And you know, you, you covered a very, very wide and diverse sub subject area. Obviously, the oceans, as you say, cover seventy-two percent of the Earth's um, the, the Earth's coverage. Um, and there are many, many different factors which affect it. And you've highlighted them fantastically. Very, very good presentation. Um, we did have we did have a, a question actually come up in the chat from Louis in relation to you were talking about biodiversity and the biodiversity um, targets. You can actually access the, the national targets, and I've put it into the chat box. Here is one link if you want to make a note of it. Um, you can actually look right. at the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, which is, is a legal requirement, um, which, which has a number of actions which should be completed mm. by 2020. <laughs> um, and you can get that from the error website and the, the, yeah. the, the website link there error.org.mt but there's another another way you can get to it and I'm just going to again put it into the chat, into the chat box. But. Yeah and um, that one I showed where the 2020 IHE targets were that was a, a pdf so I can if anyone wants me to send it to them um, I can include it here if you want. No problem and here here is another this is another web link biodiversity.europa.eu Mm. That will actually take you, the link will take you to the European Union's portal and every country within the European Union has to submit plans and regulations and the documents are put together. So for more information you can also go there. Um, as, as an organisation obviously, although our primary focus is on sharks, skates and rays, we have a passion about the marine environment because the animals that we love and we're researching need that environment to survive. So we, we look at everything on a very very much a holistic basis um, and obviously biodiversity is, is a critical component of a healthy marine ecosystem. Thank you for the comment on the on the talk there Louis, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> if, you do have, if you do have any follow-on questions um, that, you, that you think of as soon as we all disappear which is usually <laughs> then you can always send an email to our, our secretary through the info at Shark Lab Malta org. You can check out the Shark Lab Malta website, which is www.sharklab-malta.org and find out a lot more about the fascinating research and work that, that we do as an organization. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free. Like Rachel says, if you want to get involved, feel free. The most important thing that people can give to us as an organization is time. And time is something which is priceless. So if you do have a few minutes, a few hours or more and wish to get involved in any way shape and form it would be fantastic to see you at an event when we start to um, sort of like go out into the public arena but also you know while while we're kind of still semi semi locked away and just keep <laughs> ourselves to ourselves feel free to follow us on facebook and, and through the website and thank you again rachel and Roslyn, for for making this possible and pam thank you. Thank you for your support and with that, I'm going to say thank you Finish, and okay. Zoom wave and thank you very much. <laughs> the yeah. Zoom wave. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.